So with this video, we're going to look at control of respiration. And um, <clears throat> so as we uh, begin talking about this, we'll talk first about where, um, where this control is located. So we have autonomic control of respiratory rate and the depth of respiration uh, coming from a couple of places. One is the respiratory center found at the medulla oblongata. Um, and there are two uh, groups of cells that are, of neurons that are controlling respiration in the medulla. Uh, the ventral respiratory group is what, what manages the basic rhythm of unconscious breathing. And the dorsal respiratory group is, uh, is the portion that is controlling or stimulating the muscles uh, that do inspiration, especially the diaphragm. So if we want uh, deeper inspirations with more uh, draw into the lungs, then the dorsal respiratory group will give even more stimulation to the, uh, the inspiratory muscles, including the diaphragm. And then in the pons, there is another respiratory group called the pontine respiratory group. So this would be a recognition that it's found in the pons. Um, and <clears throat> it contributes to that the rhythm, the, the rhythmicity, and the, the speed with which we are breathing by limiting the amount of inspiration that can happen. And so there are some reflexive responses that prevent us from over-inflating the lungs, and they're managed there, the pontine respiratory group. So uh, before we can really make sense of a lot of this control, we need to understand a little bit about, um, you know, the book goes into talking about partial pressures and uh, what that all means. So if we know that air pressure is approximately 760 milligrams of mercury, um, so that's the total air pressure. Well, we can calculate how much of that total air pressure is, is, is controlled or is, is given that, that is is responsible, made responsible by, yeah, I know that's making sense. Let me try this again. So we can calculate the percentage of the uh, total air pressure that is made up of any one component of the air, if that makes sense. So we know that air is 21% oxygen. So the air that we breathe around us has about, you know, about 21% of that air is oxygen. And so if we multiply 0 0.21 times 760 millimeters mercury, we can say that 160 of those millimeters mercury are contributed by oxygen. CO2 is a much, much smaller component of the air that we breathe. It's 0.04% carbon dioxide. So when you multiply that, so if you move the decimal two places over, remember the conversion between a decimal number and a percentage number, um, and multiply that by 760, we see that very little air pressure is the result of the amount of carbon dioxide that's found in the air. The bulk of air is actually nitrogen. So 78% of the air that we breathe is nitrogen. And so that means that the partial pressure for nitrogen is 593 millimeters mercury. So three partial pressures here that are, um, that, that, that are re the reflection of the percentage of gas that's uh, found in the air that we breathe. So um, we can think about air pressure, both as actual partial pressures caused by each of the individual um, individual components of the air, or we can think about it as percentage, but it's going to be the same concept either way. And the book, so the book moves now, we've talked a lot about concentration of things, but the book moves over now to d discussing um, the the diffusion of oxygen and the diffusion of carbon dioxide as being related to partial pressure. So the point of this slide is to help you see um, that when we talk about percentage or concentration,
it's the same idea as talking about partial pressures. The smallest percentage has the lowest partial pressure. The highest percentage has the highest partial pressure. And here's oxygen somewhere in the middle in ambient air. Okay, so that's one bit of physics or chemistry. You could go either way with that. And I also wanted to show you how we measure partial uh, air pressure. So this is a diagram, of a, a simplified diagram of, of, of how we would measure it. If you had a tube that you created a vacuum in, okay, so it's an empty tube, or you could actually build this by filling a tube with mercury and then inverting the tube upside down in a bowl of mercury so that the mercury could flow up or down. Air pressure pushing down on the surface of the, of the mercury in the bowl causes an amount of mercury to be forced up into the tube that is um, anywhere that is not mercury it's going to be a vacuum so no air at all. And so we talk about air pressure based on the height of the mercury in the tube. And so 760 millimeters that means that um, air pressure will, uh, you know, at sea level, will force 760 millimeters of mercury to stand up in this tube. So we would measure that difference, distance, and see it's 760 millimeters. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit more sense now why we use millimeters of mercury. So this was the standard for measuring air pressure for a long time. We now rely on other tools, but um, we still. Um, compare that standard against either the height of the um, mercury in the column in millimeters or here in the United States we generally tend to use the height of the column in inches. And so uh, 760 millimeters is somewhere on approximately 29 and a half to 30 and a half or so millimeters of mercury, somewhere in there, about 30 millimeter, uh, 30 inches, I'm sorry, I should back that up again. So 760 millimeters is almost 30 inches. Okay, so that's a little bit more physics, how we measure air pressure. This conversation about partial pressures that the book brings up. Any, and, and as you're reading it, if you want to just keep it simple for yourself, anytime you see a large partial pressure, think a large percentage. Anytime you see a small partial pressure, think a smaller percentage. And then the last thing that I wanted to make clear is that when we dissolve carbon dioxide in water, so that's what I'm showing here with this equation, carbon dioxide dissolved into water makes a material called carbonic acid. Now notice, I want you to notice that all we've done is add carbon to water. So you always lead with the H for some reason, this is a chemistry rule. So H2, H2, okay, that makes sense. There's the two H's. There's a carbon, here's the carbon, and then O3. Notice the three here. So there's two oxygens here, and there's only one oxygen there, so we add those two together, there's three oxygens. This substance, H2CO3, is called carbonic acid. And as an acid, one thing that it happens when you dissolve carbonic acid in water, which it would be if you had a watery solution that you were putting carbon dioxide into, that carbonic acid then immediately breaks apart, releasing a hydrogen ion. So now we have a hydrogen ion here. That's what causes the effects of acidity, is that H plus ion there in solution and it'll run around and react with stuff, so acids tend to cause things to react. And when you peel a hydrogen off of this H2CO3, what you leave behind is HCO3. So there's the bicarbonate ion. And then there's one other thing that the hydrogen leaves behind. It leaves behind an extra electron. That get, electrons have a negative charge, so that gives the bicarbonate ion a negative charge. And when it leaves behind its electron, it's now lost a, a negative charge, so now the ion is a positive charge, so we have a hydrogen ion. So hydrogen ion is positive, 
because it's lost an electron. Bicarbonate ion is negative because it picked up that electron that the hydrogen lost. So when we dissolve carbon dioxide in water, we make carbonic acid, which almost immediately falls apart into the hydrogen ion and the bicarbonate ion. This causes the fluids that carbon dioxide is dissolved in to become acidic. So um, that's straight up set of chemical reactions. And we'll see in a little bit that the chemical reactions can go this way, so the blood becomes acidic, or it can go the opposite direction. Everything can go in this direction. So if we have bicarbonate ion dissolved in water, and we add a little bit of acid to it, if we find a hydrogen, we can link the hydrogen back to the bicarbonate ion, make carbonic acid, and then the carbonic acid will fall apart into a CO2 molecule and a water molecule. So this is what's referred to as a reversible reaction. Because it can go forward, that would be this direction, making hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion, or it can go backward, that would be upstream here, where we make CO2 and water. Okay, so there it is. That's all the chemistry you're going to get in this class. Not much. Um, and well, maybe I've given you a little bit somewhere else. But uh, yeah, not a lot of chemistry in our class. But having an understanding of chemistry certainly is helpful. Okay, so with those under your belt then, we can talk a little bit now about control. All right, so there are two kinds of control. And they are both provided by chemoreceptors. So if you think back to the chapter on sensory systems and sensation, chemoreceptors are um, neurons that at their dendrite ends or at, as part of the cell, they have um, the ability to notice changes in chemical concentrations. And so central chemoreceptors are found in the central nervous system at the medulla. So here we are talking about our, our um, respiratory center at the, at the medulla, and it's driven by chemoreception. And the job of the chemoreceptors in the medulla is to monitor the pH of the cerebrospinal fluid that is flowing around the brain and the, and the spinal cord. And as we just saw, the pH of our cerebrospinal fluid is very dependent on the concentration of oxygen found dissolved in the blood that then, I'm sorry, the concentration of CO2 dissolved in the blood. And so as CO2 is dissolved into blood, we make hydrogen ions. Those hydrogen ions pass over into the cerebrospinal fluid, making the cerebrospinal fluid acidic. So as the ions cross, or actually, rather than the ions, it's the CO2. It's actual undissolved CO2 that, or unreacted CO2 that crosses over. So carbon dioxide flows easily across the blood-brain barrier. And um, when it gets into cerebrospinal fluid, then the CO2 will produce carbonic acid and release hydrogen ions. That then turns the cerebrospinal fluid into a somewhat more acidic fluid. So in response, what we do to all this, well, one way to get rid of CO2 is, think about that one for a minute, what can we do to get rid of CO2 out of the body? So hopefully you thought of, you breathe it out. So we can pull that backward version of the carbonic acid equation. So if we breathe out CO2, if we lose CO2 at the lungs, then that's going to have a tendency to cause carbonic acid, oops, H2CO3, more carbonic acid to fall apart into CO2. And at the very farthest end of the equation, we're going to see bicarbonate ions 
joining up with hydrogen ions to form carbonic acid to replace the carbonic acid that fell apart into the CO2 in order to replace the CO2 that was breathed out. So we do, we run this, this system by stimulating the, the, the central chemoreceptors at the medulla oblongata. They start a reflex that stimulates a, a more rapid breathing or perhaps even deeper breathing. And along the, and, and as part of that process, then we breathe out CO2 and the blood becomes less acidic. But while we're breathing out CO2, what are we going to be breathing in even more, uh, you know, it, it, breathing in at the same time? So every breath out is sending away CO2, but along the way, we also build up oxygen again in the blood. So as carbon dioxide builds up because we are using a lot of oxygen to make en ATP energy and producing lots of CO2 at the far side of that, set of equations. As the CO2 builds up, it causes the blood to become acidic, and it also causes cerebrospinal fluid to become acidic. And so in response to this acidic nature of the cerebrospinal fluid, we see an increase in respiration. You see increase in breathing, in ventilation activities. And so we are able to repair the deficit in oxygen, but we do it because we've sensed an increase in over, uh, an overage in carbon dioxide. So it, it turns out central chemoreceptors, they have almost, they don't respond to O2 at all. They're not interested in what O2 oxygen levels in blood are doing. All they care about, all that they notice is that, uh-oh, CO2 concentration is getting up. As CO2 is going up, it's going up because we're using O2 to make ATP. So that means oxygen is going down. And so as we try to correct for this increase in CO2 by breathing out additional carbon dioxide, we are also bringing in oxygen. Hopefully that's clear. So central chemoreceptors they respond to carbon dioxide. And they respond pretty quickly. It doesn't take a much additional carbon dioxide to get your, um, get those central chemoreceptors to begin the reflex. And if you've ever done any um, exercise, you know this. It doesn't take very long before <sighs> you're pant panting pretty good because of this additional carbon dioxide. So primary control over respiration rate is not provided by oxygen. That's what most people think coming into this class. But instead, it's provided by carbon dioxide as it causes the acidity of cerebrospinal fluid to increase. We also see peripheral chemoreceptors. These peripheral chemoreceptors are, rather than responding to carbon dioxide, they respond to low oxygen. The peripheral chemoreceptors are found out in the, the peripheral tissues. One is in the carotid body, bodies of the carotid artery, and the other is found in the aorta. It's called, uh, those, the sensors are the aortic bar bodies, and they do monitor oxygen. And when oxygen gets low, they send information up to the respiratory center in the medulla, and we see an increase in uh, breathing rate and in the tidal volume as you breathe. But it turns out that you must get really low in carbon dioxide. You have to be about 50% below normal. That's a level at which you're probably beginning to pass out if you're not passed out, passed out already. And so, in order to trigger this reflex where we respond to these low levels of oxygen, it instead, um, you know, it, it's coming pretty late in the game. So really, again, primary control of our breathing, our respiration, is all around the buildup of carbon dioxide in the body.
So that's the bottom line. Breathing reflex driven by CO2 concentrations. Increase in CO2 means a decrease in pH. And the cerebral, uh, and so the, the reflex forces the body to take a breath. Now you can mess around with this, and that was part of the lab that we did last night, um, by hyperventilating. So if you do a lot of rapid, shallow breathing, what you wind up doing is blowing off the CO2 that you've made in your lung, or that you've made, and passing it out of the lungs without really doing a lot of resupply of carbon dioxide. And so if people try this before they, say, go diving or, um, or you know, doing any water sports where they're going to try to be underwater for a long time, you can actually so deplete CO2 that it takes a really long time before your autonomic system says, hey, it's time to take a breath. So you pass out, and then when breathing finally begins, drowning is what usually happens because... Um, because you know, trying to breathe while you're unconscious is a bad choice, and underwater is a bad choice. So, hopefully, uh, the control of CO of um, of uh, respiration makes sense. It's driven at the medulla oblongata. It's controlled by carbon dioxide, and um, and it's there is also some secondary control that uses oxygen as the, the sensed gas, but that will only kick in very late in the game. There are also some mechanoreceptor reflexes. So if you remember mechanoreceptors, these respond to being stretched or pulled or deformed in some way. And so there is an inflation reflex that as we get close to fully expanding the lungs, then respiration slows down until it stops. And so it's an inhibition of the ability of the external intercostal muscles to uh, contract. So we inhibit that. And the point of this inflation reflex, it prevents overinflating the lungs. And so we don't wind up with a lot of like uh, stress um, on the lung tissue because we don't allow ourselves to um, overstretch the lungs. Emotions, the limbic system also has um, a role in controlling the respiration uh, rate and force. So uh, fear, pain, emotional upset, love, you know, uh, getting to smooch on your sweetie can also get respiration kicked up. Um, and then finally, we do have some voluntary conscious control of respiration, um, and we exercise all that from the cerebral cortex. So we're like, I need to, um, you know, I need to, I want to breathe more, or, you know, we, we can think our way in, into making that happen. All right, so that's everything I've got to say about control control of how rapidly and how deeply we breathe. And if you have questions, again, please do not hesitate to ask.